It is. Oh, Alright, this is the glass flame working demo at the Corning Museum of Glass in uh, Corning, New York. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the flame working demonstration. My name is Vince. Flame working here is actually just another type of glass blowing, but one where we use a torch as our heat source instead of a furnace, like what you'll see over at the hot glass show today. Now, this torch here is running on a mixture of natural gas and compressed oxygen, and I control the flow of the gases with the knobs on the back end of the torch right here. At its hottest, I can actually turn this torch all the way up to about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, it's not that hot right now. It's probably just over about 3,000. And I'm not going to need it to be that hot for the little demonstration piece I'll be making for you here. But even at that high temperature, I'm still pretty safe and quite comfortable inside the booth. You see, the radiant heat coming off of both the glass and the flame, to me, is just like standing in direct sunlight on a warm summer day. So I'm actually pretty safe and quite comfy cozy inside the booth here. Makes it one of the more enjoyable demonstrations for me this time of year. I see that's possible because the oxygen running through the torch is focusing the heat on the glass and away from me in that direction. We also have a very good ventilation system inside the booth here that's keeping me safe and cool. Now there's going to be a couple of different things I'll be doing constantly throughout the demonstration besides just narrating for you. One of those things I'll be constantly doing is I'll be turning the glass rods in my hand. Sometimes I'll do that a little slower, a little bit faster. That all depends on what I need at any given point. Sometimes I'll use a little back and forth motion. But I'm going to be constantly doing that for two important reasons. The first of all, I'm doing it to offset the force of gravity. You see, at this temperature, the glass is as hot as lava but it'll move with the consistency of like molasses or warm honey. So just to keep the glass on the end of the rod, I've got to constantly be turning it in my hands. If I was to stop, the glass could actually drip right on the countertop, and that wouldn't make for a very good demonstration. Now the second reason I'm always turning the glass is because I'm trying to heat it evenly. You see, if I was to stop rotating the glass, whatever portion of it's facing the front of the torch would become the hottest almost instantly and everything else would just be relatively hot by comparison. When I go to shape or stretch the glass, that uneven heat could cause it to do so quite unevenly. So to keep everything on the end of the rod, to keep everything heated evenly, we'll be constantly rotating it. Now you might notice when I put the glass into the flame, it goes from blue to orange. Are you seeing that? The flame will change colors. That's a result of some of the sodium burning out of the material. Now we refer to that as soda flare. Now, soda flare is not harmful to your vision, especially for the short little duration you're going to be exposed to it here. But if you stare at it long enough, it'll give you a pretty bad headache. So to avoid that headache, at some point during the demonstration, come on up and look through the darker panels on the front of the booth there. Those dark panels, just like my glasses, are didymium filters. The didymium filter will filter out that specific orange wavelength of light that's a result of the soda flare. It'll make it a lot easier for you to see what I'm doing here. That's going to come in handy when we get down to the uh, get down to these finer details. The longest I've ever worked on the torch is when I was going to school for this. I was on the torch for five hours once, and without didymium filters, I'd probably see spots forever. Just one of those hidden tools we have as glass artists to help us shape and work in the material. So now you see me attaching a smaller diameter rod to the back side of this orb that I've made. This is going to help me set up a secondary handle. It's going to come in handy, uh, funny that, come in handy when we get down to the end of the demonstration. It's going to allow me to flip these handles around 180 degrees and change hands. Allow me to work another portion of this basic setup I'm creating for the sculpture. Now, I haven't given away what I'm making yet because we're going to get so far I'm going to let these kids up here try and guess what we're making. Doesn't look like too much right now, but just hang in there. Like I said, we're just working on the basic shape here. 
When we get to the details, then you'll be able to pretty easily guess what we're making. Don't worry, it's going to be fun, I promise. So I've been working in glass for just over four years. Originally studied art and design at a small college in New Jersey. Been working with the museum here for about eight or nine months. I guess that was May of last year. I guess that pushes it more to like 10 months. But if I wanted to continue my education, or if maybe you felt like this was something you'd like to try, we're actually both in luck. You see, we could take classes together right here at the museum. Just across the parking lot in that direction, we have an adjacent building that we call a studio. It's a world-class teaching facility where we bring in artists from all around the world to teach us their tricks in glass. And we've got everything from beginner classes to summer-long courses. There's even classes you could sign up for today. It only takes a little bit of time. It's very inexpensive, and it's a heck of a lot of fun. But you can actually try out this very same process. You can see I've got this brass paddle here that's got sort of a sharp edge to one inside. It's allowing me to set up distinction between the two forms that I've created. It's going to help us keep that distinct line in the middle. That's what we want to keep. You'll see why in just a second. We're coming down to it. It's so like I said, I've been working with glass for about four years, but that actually makes me somewhat of a relative newcomer. You see, some of the other artists that I work with here at the museum have been working in glass for upwards of 30 years. But even they sometimes tell me that they learn new stuff all the time. You see, you could actually spend a lifetime working glass and not learn everything there is to learn. It's such a difficult material, such a finicky material to work with. Give you a little bit of a basis for comparison. Some of the big names in the glass art world, some of the superstars I like to refer to them as, names like Dale Chihuly or Lino Tagliapetra, Gianni Toso, Paul Stankert. In some cases, those artists have been working with glass for upwards of 50 years. Now, if you're familiar with those artists, or if you've seen those names today here at the museum, because we have a collection of each of their work, you definitely see that all that time and experience does make for some incredible artwork. Who knows, one day, if I hang in there, maybe you'll see my little sculpture pieces in a museum. Keep our fingers crossed on that one. Okay, so you can see just by controlling the flow of the gases, I can change the size and shape of the heat source from about a broom handle down to a spaghetti strand. That allows me to work smaller and smaller details like the ones I'm about to do now. I've been working in color glass primarily, but now I've got a little bit of color glass. You guys see that? Now, color glass and clear glass have the same basic three ingredients. Those three ingredients are powdered limestone, refined sand, and soda ash. Those are all elements that are mined from the earth. The color glass has at least one more ingredient. Color glass has different metal oxides mixed in there. That's basically rust. Now, what we generally think of as rust is actually iron oxide. You know, the stuff we find on our cars or some junk laying around the backyard? That's iron oxide. Iron or steel oxide will give us green glass. The purple glass I'm using comes from manganese oxide. Tin and titanium give us white. Cadmium and selenium give us yellows and oranges, and I bet everybody can guess what color cobalt oxide would give us. Anybody want to guess that one? Cobalt oxide? It gives us blue glass. Did you gonna say was gonna say blue? Yeah. That's a pretty strong and stable color. It's probably why we see so much of it. It's also very nice looking. Okay, so we're pretty much along here. Does anybody want to guess what we're making? Is here we're making? Go ahead, just shout it out. Snowman. Here over here. What'd you say? No, it's not a bear. A Anybody else say? It's a pig. Yeah, somebody said it over there. We're making bacon. Yeah. <laughs> making bacon. And if we got a little bit of time, yeah, we got some time. We're going to put wings on them and make them a flying pig. What do you guys think about that? That'll be fun, right? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, flying pigs. Really like that whimsical stuff. Sometimes I like to put mustaches on mice. <coughs> Call those mouse stashes. <laughs> Yep. Those mice, they prefer wine with their cheese. It's okay, I can make French jokes. I'm French. <laughs> so every time we add glass from one source to another, we have to do that by getting those two glasses roughly the same glowing hot temperature. They need to be glowing bright white. That way when I get the glass to stick together, I don't have to force them to do that. All I have to do is touch them together and they'll flow nice and smoothly and evenly together. That's the kind of connection we're looking for when we're talking about creating a permanent, stable sculpture here. We call that kind of a connection a hot seal. 
That does imply there is such a thing as a cold seal, and there actually is a use for cold seals. Cold seals are used for temporary connections when we create handles. Anytime we need to turn the sculpture around, just by getting the glass glowing warm, it'll stick for a few minutes and then break away very easily. That's what a cold seal is for. But everything we're doing here is going to be hot seal. So we got a little bit of a wad of glass on the back of our pig here. This is going to be his wing. To get the texture in the wing, we're going to use these metal mashers here that got some teeth on them. You see a little bit of texture? No, 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 no. We're going to squeeze some texture right into that gob of glass. There we go. Doesn't look much like a wing, though, does it? Kind of looks like a seashell on his back. So to make it look more like a wing, we're going to heat it up and stretch it out. That's not as easy as it sounds. You see, the glass has to be hot enough to move, but not hot enough to melt away the texture we just put in there. So there's actually a very small window of opportunity for me to make this move. And you can see, when the glass starts to move, but still has that texture, that's when it's the right time to go for it. It takes an awful lot of practice to learn when's the right time. But something like several hundred pigs later, I'm actually getting pretty good at it. So just at the edge of the flame, I can take away the remainder, bring his wing to a little point. And there we go, there's our first pig wing. Okay, so doing one is easy. Doing two that look just about the same, that's tough. Anytime we do two of anything, two arms, two legs, two wings, the second one generally starts out a little bit bigger than the first one. But that's because if I make a mistake, I can, it's easier to remove the glass than it is to put it back. You'll see, like I said, that second wing is going to start just a little bit larger than the first. Flying pigs, flying pigs. My friends here at the museum really like the flying pigs. I was told if I make enough of them, I could probably sell them and bring home the bacon. <coughs> Ooh, cheesy joke, oh no! Yeah, I like to ham it up inside the booth. Oh, two in a row, you guys didn't see that coming, did you? Yeah, I've got cheesy jokes, but hopefully they don't bore you. Uh. Oh, come on, that's clever. Come on. <laughs> this is normally the slow season for us, so I have to find ways to entertain myself when nobody shows up to my shows. So I come up with cheesy jokes for you. Okay, second wing, starting out slightly larger than the first. Now, the type of glass I'm using is actually a very special type of glass. This type of glass is called borosilicate glass, and we call it that because it has boron mixed into it. The boron's an element that works as a stabilizer in glass. It increases the overall melting temperature and makes it much more resilient to something we call thermal shock. Thermal shock is when any material, in this case glass, undergoes a huge change in temperature either direction over a short amount of time. A good example of thermal shock is when you pour warm soda over top of ice cubes and the ice cubes crack into pieces. Yeah, that's basically thermal shock. And that can happen very easily in our little glass sculpture. You see, the thin parts of the sculpture want to cool quickly, but the thicker parts hold the heat longer and cool slowly. That uneven cooling puts stress in glass, and too much stress equals shock. So to avoid that, the type of glass, like I said, this has got boron mixed into it, so it's more resilient to that big temperature change. And you can see with this process, I'm going from room temperature rods to blazing hot little pigs here in a very short amount of time. If I was to do this with the glass you have around your home, it wouldn't work. The glass you have around your home is called soda lime glass because of those three basic ingredients, refined sand, powdered limestone, and soda ash. Get it? Limestone, soda lime, soda ash. You see the type of glass around your home, a drinking glass, if I was to put it in this hot torch, it would instantly shatter. It's just too hot and too quick. So the borosilicate glass is more resilient to that temperature change. It makes it much better material for us glass workers. There we go, not bad. All right. Okay, so the little flying pigs, they don't fly very well. They, however, crash quite dramatically. <laughs> so, to make him look like he's flying, we're gonna put a little ornament loop on his back. To do that, we're gonna jump down to a smaller flame, use a smaller rod, and warm a little spot on his back, and we're gonna build sort of like a little donut on his back. A little donut we can loop, turn it 
into a little ornament hook loop. That way somebody can hang them up in a window one day or maybe on a Christmas tree. That right over to his back. So, like I said, the extreme heat in the torch allows me to get the glass upwards of 3,000 to 5,000 degrees. Is anybody wondering how it is I can still hold that rod in my hand and not be burned? Really? Nobody's concerned with my safety at all? <laughs> Nobody at all? Okay, now the reason that this is possible. That little pig is probably over about 1,500 degrees. Look how close I can hold my hand. It's not even warm yet. Not even getting warm yet. Now the reason that's possible is because the glass is an insulator. It's not a conductor. So it will hold that heat for a really long time wherever you put it, but it's not going to transmit it down the length of the rod to my hand. I'm pretty thankful for that because I don't know how I would do this same sculpture wearing oven mitts. I don't think that would work out too well. You see, I'm relying primarily on the dexterity of my fingers to allow me to turn the glass and to help sculpt the glass. This process is an awful lot like sculpted clay, except for the fact that I can't touch the material. So just by using gravity and using the dexterity of my fingers, that's the only tools I really have to shape the glass. So on top of that, sculpted clay, you don't have to keep the clay, the clay constantly hot. So we're putting little nubs of glass on his body here. We're creating his little pig feet. Smaller flames, smaller rods for a smaller detail. Now, if you guys have any questions, I hope you're saving them up. At the end of the demonstration, I'll step out of this booth here and I'll answer any questions you might have about this process, perhaps any other process you've seen throughout the day. If you'd like some tips on some interesting things to see while you're at the museum, I can provide you with that as well. Just like to hang out and meet the artist, that's cool too. <laughs> Love meeting new people. So we're going to melt those little nubs down so they're a little bit more round. We're going to add a little bit of black glass on each one of his feet so he looks like he's got little piggy hooves. Just a real quick, I can actually paint, almost practically paint the glass to one another. With a very tiny strand like this, I can actually spell your name out on the side of the pig. Just by controlling that heat source and controlling how thin the glass is. Of course, I'm not very good at cursive, so you probably wouldn't want to see that. We're going to heat all four of his feet at the same time. Check and make sure that he stands nice and evenly on a countertop. That's what we're looking for. He's got his one little leg up in the air. Jump down to a smaller flame. We're going to give him ears, and then we're going to get him off of that really long tail that he has. <laughs> So the last step in this process is actually the longest step. But don't worry, it's not something you have to stand around and watch. It's a slow cooling process that all glass has to go through called the annealing cycle. Remember how we talked about that thermal shock cracks where the thin parts cool quickly and the thin parts, or the thicker parts hold the heat longer and cool slowly? To alleviate the stress caused by that uneven cooling, now the pig is going to sit in about a nine hour slow cooling process that takes place inside a computer controlled oven that I have back here. That oven runs at about 900 degrees. That's hot enough to stabilize the glass, but it's not hot enough to melt the pig. He'll come down about 100 degrees every hour. And about this time tomorrow, we'll be able to take him out and handle him and get a good look at him. Now that slow cooling process doesn't change too much for the different types of glass there are that are out there. What does change is the length of time the glass has to cool. To give you an example, our little pig's going to take about nine hours to cool off. But the largest piece of glass ever constructed, which we have in the museum, it's about 200 feet that way in the optics gallery, gigantic magnifying lens for a telescope. It's a reflecting lens. Sorry, not a magnifying lens, a reflecting lens. It's 15 tons of glass. It went through that same slow cooling process, but it took eight months to cool now. Just to give you an idea just how drastically that time frame can change depending on how thick and how large the glass can be. Okay, so now we're heating that last handle and turning it into our last detail. How do you turn something functional like a handle into something aesthetic like a pig's tail? It's called killing two birds with one stone. 
or one pig with one flame, in this case. So a little twist, puts a perfect little curly Q pigtail on the back side of our sculpture. Uh -huh. A little bit too much. Remove a little bit of excess material there, and there we go, everybody. There's our little Christmas ornament flying pig. So if you have any questions, oh, thank you. If you have any questions, I'm going to step out of the booth and answer them for you. If not, enjoy the rest of your day at the museum, everybody. Thanks for visiting. How did the door go? I didn't know it was three glass frame. We're going to get a quick look at this. I can't see where I was either. Okay, have you just made? Come on. Is that cool? the door wall. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch it. How did you say you stayed like cool in there? Yeah. Oh, there's a ventilation system underneath the roof. That's it.